wonder if I should have left a little earlier. I was going to leave at 4.30. Because I forgot about weather and the roads were icy. They're nice now as I approach St. Paul, but nasty on the way down. So many cars in the ditch and overturned. And But we're on the road now. Starting off my Texas, little brief Texas adventure, looking for that social fly catcher on the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley campus. No social fly catcher yet, but did get tropical kingbird and a fulvous whistling duck with a bunch of uh, black bellied whistling ducks. The last time I'd seen a fulvous whistling duck was in 2004 at Anahuac National Wildlife Refuge in Texas. These guys used to be known as tree ducks because they nest in tree cavities. And they're much more range restricted than the black bellied whistling duck, which are very common in South Texas. And as I was walking around campus, I found this American kestrel, started photographing it and realized it's got some prey. And yeah, I think it's an animal. Oh, he was trying to get this thing off the branch and eat it. It was uh, pretty gruesome. As it was getting kind of late in the afternoon, I knew the red crown parrots were going to start roosting in a few hours so i made my way over to where ebird said i should go joe and tony oliver park found the nice loggerhead shrike out hunting and joining him in the search for prey was a cooper's hawk that was darn approachable yeah i don't see many of those up here in northern minnesota so it was a treat kept walking around the park, found one of my target birds, a, a little flock of yellow-throated warblers foraging in trees. That was pretty cool. I've never photographed them before, and in fact, I've rarely seen them ever before. So a nice find. As the sun started to go down, I started to hear flocks of red-crowned parrots, but they kept going over the park and headed to the neighborhoods to the, to the east. So I... <laughs> boogied over there and was able to track down a few on the power lines. Not the best view, but man, the noise as the sun went down was just incredible. What a cacophony. And speaking of cacophony, the, the great tail grackles at the HEB store where I went to get my groceries for the week and a little cooler was deafening. Thousands. Well, it is my second full day in the morning and it is gray skies and windy. I am having a hard time deciding where to go because the photography probably won't be very good, but there are birds I'd like to see. So what I usually do, get in the car and see which way it goes. <laughs> I've only been here 10 minutes, I'm already sitting on the ground. Right over there, had white tipped dove. Inca dove. Kiskadi. And got my model duck in that pond right by the gate. Off to a good start. Plus it's clearing up.
and along the alligator trail and these woods with leaf litter seem to be a favorite for the parakis for roosting at night there's one right there And then if we go down the trail, just a few feet. They're so well camouflaged. I, oh, I lost it, but there it is. There's another one right there. And this is the common paraki. And they are native to South Texas. And you can see all the way into South America. And they are sleeping during the day here because they only get active towards dawn and dusk. That's when they start foraging for insects, especially beetles. But unlike the related and maybe more familiar common nighthawk, which flies around way up in the air nabbing mosquitoes, the paraki sits on the ground and maybe a low perch and silhouettes these flying beetles against the sky. will just jump up, grab it, and come back down. Maybe they'll do little flights, but nothing like the common nighthawk. And see that tiny, tiny little beak? That opens to form this big, gaping mouth to inhale beetles. Do you recognize this alien creature? Well, it's just a common paraki when viewed from behind. As you can see, even when they're sleeping slash resting, you can keep an eye out in front of them and behind them. So these parakis are very exciting because this was one of my goals for photos. Um, I've gotten really bad ones with flash many years ago. Yeah, these guys are just sleeping away. They think nobody can see them, possibly see them. So we're just going to leave them alone now. Look who I ran into <laughs> at Boca Chica. Wait, Boca Chica. <laughs> Estero Llano Grande. It was Dale and Cindy from Minnesota. They are volunteers with my organization, the Friends of Sac Zimbog. They spend a few months down in South Texas each winter and then head back north. It was fun. We got to bird together a little bit on this trip. So yeah, just a blast running into them. Great folks. If I haven't told you, one of my crazy, probably worthless goals in life is to photograph 600 species of birds in uh, North America, north of Mexico. I think I've seen 640 species or so, and I put them all on my sparkyphotos.com site. But photographed, I think I'm at like 5, I don't know, 525? And I put all those on sparkyphotos.com, and they're arranged alphabetically. Yeah, not phylogenetically. Sorry, birders. I continued to wander around the different ponds at Estero Llano Grande. You know, this place wasn't even active, wasn't even here when I was in the, the valley last. So what a pleasure to quote unquote discover this place. Fantastic for birding and photography. Highly recommended. Kind of a neat surprise to find this cinnamon teal. You know, I'm I don't, I'm not an obsessive e-birder, so it's always a treat to find things you don't know are going to be where you're at. Fun to see this great egret with a snowy egret. Really shows you the size difference. And I love how these snowies are reaching around in the mud with their feet, probably trying to dislodge some invertebrates. Yeah, pretty cool hunting technique. I think it's time to head out from Estero Llano Grande. What a day, yeah. I think let's, let's head over to Benson and try and get those hook-filled kites. Yeah, no problem. But they've been perching. Usually you see them soaring a mile overhead, but these have been perching, so let's give it a shot. 
exiting through the gift shop, I found this uh, book, and what a surprise. It had uh, several of my photos in it, um, and Ryan's, my friend photo buddy Ryan. So, yeah, they had some of the, the top photos kind of combined into this book. So, yeah, what a blast to see that. We participated in the Valley Land Trust photo contest for a few years, well, quite a few years ago now. The contest was run by the Valley Land Fund, whose mission was to basically work with private ranch owners and landowners to set aside part of their farm operations, ranch operations, for wild lands. 97% of Texas is in private hands, so it's a really important program. For the contest, they'd team up photographers with ranch owners, and you had six months, you could only shoot on that ranch, and there were categories for everything, from spiders to beetles to frogs to snakes, all kinds of bird categories, mammal categories. It was crazy. You could only submit so many, and then your photos were scored and judged by a panel. Ryan and I did all right. We were there in 2006 and 2008, we won a few categories. <laughs> kind of fun. We shot on Grandma Trudy's land. She owned the ranch just adjacent to Santa Ana National Wildlife Refuge. And there was this old risaca on the land, an old oxbow of the Rio Grande. And we thought, hey, let's build a floating blind. And Ryan is really good at making things and coming up with ideas. And so we headed off to Home Depot, got some two-inch insulation foam board and some PVC pipe and went to town. It was a blast. You'd get out on the Rosaka and this floating blind. You were just invisible to the wildlife. We got least bitterns up close and even were able to sneak up on their nest. But then occasionally you'd drop into these holes and we'd <laughs> just freak out because you'd think, oh, these are alligator holes. But Grandma Trudy said there were no alligators, so we believed her. She had turned part of her ranch back into wild land. Of course, front-lit, perfect bird portraits do really well in the contest. The contest also rewards creativity, and so we tried some reflections and backlighting and silhouettes. We even set up, well, I should say Ryan rigged up this cool flash and reflector system near a hummingbird feeder, and we got some fun ruby-throated hummingbirds and even buff-bellied hummingbird photos. We also tried to get a little behavior in our photos, like this great-tailed grackle who was really agitated. Here's one of the iconic birds of the valley, the clay-colored thrush, eating a little caterpillar. Of course, from the blinds, we also got the ringed kingfisher, big boy. And one day we decided to just plop a stick in the water, just jam it down in the mud. Within minutes, it became a favorite perch for green herons, black ground night herons, and eventually this beautiful tricolored heron that uh, won a first place in the Valley Land Fund contest. But probably my most memorable experience was one very, very windy day at Grandma Trudy's. I spotted a bobcat working its way down the trail along the Rosaka. I just froze, and the wind was so strong that the palm fronds were just slapping together making a lot of noise and the bobcat never even saw me in fact it came right towards me i was only inches off the trail i flinched because it was going to come within about <laughs> two feet of me and the minute i flinched it ran off into the jungle but prior to that he had just sat down in a little spot of sunlight and taken a little rest and that's when i snapped this photo pure luck pure luck the Valley Land Fund, a great organization. They not only purchase and protect land, they work with private ranch owners to help them turn some of their land back into Rio Grande Valley jungle. And it doesn't take long down there. Time for a little lunch. I always buy a little styrofoam cooler and some groceries. Boy, it saves time from not having to go to fast food or restaurants. The more hours I can be in the field birding or doing photography, the better. And here are my favorite photos from Estero Llano Grande this morning. Mm. 
behind the wall is that Benson State Park. I'm at Benson State Park. They're building a bloody wall through the middle of it, but at least the former superintendent negotiated to get access, otherwise it would have been cut off from the rest of the U.S. But I am looking up in these trees for hook-billed kites. I saw one many years ago as a tiny speck about a mile in the sky. But there's been some recent sightings of perch birds here. There's snails, I guess, a population of snails, and that's what they eat. Well, I haven't found a hook-billed kite, but I did find their food source. They eat terrestrial snails like this, and they'll perch in the trees and just keep their eye out, and they'll drop down, pluck them off branches or tree trunks or even the ground. They're one of the most beautiful raptors, I think, so I'm going to be looking in every tree. But there's other cool birds here too. Just saw a chachalaca, although it was tucked in the underbrush. The morning chorus of chachalacas is an amazing thing to audibly witness. Well, a little deserted these days. This is the old campground at Benson State Park and where I got my lifer blue bunting at a feeder. Winter Texans, snowbirds would be camped out here and they'd have feeders hanging from their RVs, etc. and yeah, it was just a very birdy place. Oh my gosh, I just had a hook-billed kite fly right over my head and I didn't get a photo. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's a hook-billed kite. Oh, and then it's gone. <laughs> it's a little bit backlit too. Yeah, I saw the paddle-shaped wings, the kind of longer tail, uh, the barring under the wings. Let's see if I can find them again. There's a big raptor perched up here. I'm kind of staying in the shadow of the trees here. Turns out they were Harris's hawks, which I got some really interesting photos. <laughs> I did the three stop underexposure with the sun as the background and yeah, it was kind of cool. <laughs> Down here, hawks aren't as spooky. I mean, Minnesota, you can't get a mile within a perch hawk and they just take off. There is a hawk tower here, but main hawk migration time at this spot is spring and fall. I thought I had a hook-pilled kite, but not quite. There's a cactus growing in this tree. But scanning the treetops for the hook billed kites did pay off in other ways. I saw some really cool Harris's hawks. Oh, they are gorgeous as well. And take a look at its left leg. I didn't notice this till I got the photos at home on my computer, but it was banded. I'm going to turn that number in and see what I find out about that bird. And this beautiful, beautiful gray hawk just before the sun went down. Yeah, that was certainly my best photos of gray hawk. And this red-shouldered juvie. And before I turn down a ride on the next trolley and leave Benson State Park behind, I thought I'd share what species were new for my goal of photographing 600 species in the ABA area. Certainly the tropical kingbird was a new one, yellow-throated warbler at Joe and Tony Oliveira Park, the model duck at Estero Llano Grande State Park, and the red-crowned parrots were new for me as well. But I did improve on many species as well, including the fulvous whistling duck, white-tipped dove. Yeah, I didn't have great photos of that before. Yellow-crowned night heron. That's not a common bird up here common paraki, cinnamon teal, and gray hawk, which I have gotten some really terrible flight shots in Arizona, so that was extremely satisfying. No actual lifers. The social fly catcher would have been the only one, but alas, it didn't show. But I didn't expect really any lifers on this trip anyway. It's more about photography. No, I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Walked five or six miles looking for that kite, so I deserve this. I didn't bring any water. Oh,